the other thing I tell people is I said, things that you perceive as banal and trite and meaningless now will be fascinating 50, 60 years from now. You know, what did you do for work? You know, things, uh, careers that people had 80 years ago, they must have been the most, could have been the most trivial, boring thing. Time passes and people are able to read about it. It suddenly becomes fascinating. So my, my piece of advice would be, if this is something that your listeners want to do for themselves, if this is something they want to do for a loved one, um, create that urgency. We don't know, tomorrow's never promised, and um, you know we want to safeguard these stories for, for future generations. Welcome to How We Got Here, a genealogy podcast hosted by Brian Nash, exploring the tools, tips, and resources for genealogists from Atlantic Canada and family historians from around the globe who are researching their ancestors from Atlantic Canada. Every family has a story, so stick around as Brian and his guests share the unique family stories that help shape the history and culture of Atlantic Canada. Welcome to 2024. This year I'm going to be doing things differently on this podcast and on my YouTube channel. A new podcast will be released on the last Wednesday of every month, wherever you listen to finding podcasts, and the video version will be hitting my YouTube channel one week later. In 2024, my goal on this podcast is to hear and share more wonderful stories of families just like yours, and maybe even yours if you're up to it. Remember, Every family has a story that is unique and interesting and needs to be shared. So stick around to the end of the podcast when I will be sharing more information about what I will be doing elsewhere around social media, including my, on my YouTube channel in 2024. But most importantly, I'll be letting you know how you can share your own family story with myself and other listeners like you. Knowing that my goal this year is to hear and share more family stories from my listeners and also that not all of you are ready or would be able to share uh, on a podcast, I want to help you be able to better share your own family story um, no matter what the medium. So I found an expert on that to join us today to share his experience as a journalist and professional storyteller. So let's get started with my guest, Joseph Quaterer. Hi, Joseph. Hey, Brian, how are you? Great. Um, so, as I always like to start um, with my guests, just first of all, give a brief introduction of yourself, let people know who you are, and then maybe how you got interested in, in genealogy or in storytelling in your case. Um, what, what, what prompted you to um, pursue this? Yeah, sure. So, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, excited to be here. Um, so my name uh, is again Joseph Quatter, and I'm the founder and CEO of StorySaver. StorySaver is a biography writing services company. We connect people with professional writers who artfully capture stories, combine them with photos, and create beautiful keepsake books. Um, wh what I like to say is that we are democratizing the biography writing process. So like historically, you needed to be rich or famous to work with a professional to have your story captured for your friends, your family, your progeny. We're making it affordable for um, people that aren't rich and famous to have their story captured. Um, right now, we have 75 professional writers, about 60 in the US, uh, 10 in Europe, five in Australia. Um, people say like, well, like why Australia? Uh, interestingly enough, that's the second biggest market for biography writing services. So 
I, I would have had no idea, but that's uh, that's the truth. Um, and then our writers have written for, uh, if you can name a large national newspaper magazine in the U.S., our writers have written for them, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, Forbes, The New Yorker, on and on and on. Um, but I think the, probably the more interesting aspect of your question is how I got into this, because uh, this was not always the line of work that I was in. Um, so I like to tell people that my life was always kind of bifurcated between my profession and my passion. So my profession was always finance. Uh, I got a BA in finance from the University of Notre Dame, an MBA in finance and strategy from NYU. And I was a banker on Wall Street for 17 years. Um, but my my passion was always writing. And uh, so when I was a little kid, I wrote poetry, I wrote short stories. When I was in grade school, I started writing novellas. After college, and this is why I was a banker, I started writing novels. And through my career as a banker, I wrote three different novels on the side. Um, after my third novel, I decided that what I was doing, you know, coming with stories in my head and, and writing them was not really that exciting to me anymore. And that I wanted to hear real stories from real people and share them with others. And so I started a blog where I walked around the streets of New York City. I went up to complete strangers and I would interview them about their life. I would go up to anyone from um, men in three-piece suits to homeless people. And I learned that everybody has a story to tell, but not everyone is a storyteller, and that there's a huge interest in the untold stories of others. Um, I posted more and more on my blog. My blog got up to one and a half million views. And I realized that what I was doing, interviewing people and sharing their stories with others, was journalism. So I applied to Columbia Journalism School. I never thought that I would get in in a million years. Uh, you know, Ivy League jur uh, journalism institution. And I remember when I was um, at the information session, a lot of the other candidates had interviewed heads of state, presidents, and I spent most of my time interviewing homeless people on the weekends. So I never thought I would get in, but I did. And between 2018 and 2021, I was. Um, I was a studying journalism at Columbia University. Um, in 2021, I decided to leave uh, finance and it was actually to focus on writing novels. Um, and I was just having a chance dinner with a friend one night and he said, you know, with your business background and your writing background, I have a business that I think you should start. And he, I asked what it was, and he said, you know, writing people's biographies and memoirs. And I really wasn't sure that there was an industry around that. But he said that his family had hired a company to capture his family's transition from India to the United States. And so I researched it. I found out that there was an industry around helping people capture the stories of their themselves and their families. And I also realized that I don't think that anybody was doing it perfectly from a business perspective and from a narrative writing perspective. And so in November of 2021, I launched Story Saver. And uh, a little bit over two years later, we're still here and I'm enjoying the process very much. So it's kind of a windy path, but an interesting one, I think. Definitely. I, I just uh, thinking, you know, when you were talking there, it would be a, a wide perspective of people from the, the, the like you said, the homeless person to the Wall Street banker. Um, and in 2021, not, not necessarily the optimal time to start a business, I would say, especially one that um, if your experience was going out and personally meeting the, the people originally, um, just with all the, uh, the, the changes, um so uh, that's great now so um with your with your storytelling telling people's stories I, i'm actually really interested in the first part there i just because I, I imagine you would have um story uh, stories to tell i know one of the the, the theme from my podcast my website is uh, uh my podcast and my youtube channel is um 
everybody has a story. Let's hear yours, basically. I want to help people be able to tell their stories um, of their family because, like, every every family has a, a deep history, whether they, they know it or not. Um, I know one of the things I always struggle with when I'm doing my genealogy is taking that information that I have, all the facts, and um, actually then sharing it and writing a, a biographical piece so it's just not a, a, a list of um, a list of dates and, and events as opposed to putting that, that background in there behind. Uh, I know that's one thing from talking to other genealogists that they often they often struggle with is because um, they're really interested in getting the facts and sometimes they know the stories but they don't know how to tell it right. Um, so yeah. with, your, with your company, what and I understand what you're doing there. You're, you're helping, it, and I can see this is a great resource for people that are in geology, especially when they discover that really interesting story of um, a past relative or just their family through the through the years. Um, do you focus usually on just individual biography of one person, or do you do you tell that wider? Do your writers tell help tell that wider story? Um, yeah. So just if I could go back, Brian, um, you know, because I do think it's uh, interesting about what I and, and it and it's instructive to people looking to capture stories about their about whether it's people in the family um, or or complete strangers. Um, let me just start with one little interesting anecdote. You mentioned like, yeah, I, I interviewed a lot of homeless people, and people would always say, "Why do you why do you do that?" And uh, I said, "It might sound cheesy, but." I believe that a lot of the people that are living on the street are not that different than us, and that by us understanding more about their struggles and their challenges, it can create more harmony, and that this would create a more har harmonious world. And the biggest, two biggest takeaways I had from interviewing all the homeless people was, um, number one, they're not all that different than people that are not homeless. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a stigma that they might have a lot. In, some of them do have substance abuse issues. Some of them do have psychological issues, and, and that's unfortunate. A lot of them do not, and a lot of them just don't have a support network. You know, I happen to have a, a, a family that could support me if something were to happen, if I were to have medical bills. A lot of them just don't. And, you know, you miss one rent payment, and then two rent payments, then you get evicted, and you can't wear clean clothes to... to interview for a job and then the cycle begins. Um, but the other really interesting thing that it's going to dovetail into the question that you asked is when I studied journalism at Columbia, they would say there's never any wrong answers. There's only wrong questions. So if I'm not eliciting a good response from my interviewee, it's because I'm not asking the right question. And uh, you know, again, I learned that at Columbia, but I was also, I learned that a lot when I was just interviewing people on the streets. Um, you know, when I started, Brian, I, the, the whole idea behind my blog was to share people's incredible stories, right? And so I would walk up to people and I would say, tell me the most incredible story of your life. 99% of the time, I would get met with a blank stare. They would just look at me and they, I have no idea. But if I say, tell me about the most challenging moment you've had to persevere through as a human being, 99% of people will instantly know the answer. I know my answer. If you ask me the craziest story, I don't know. If you ask me the hardest thing I've ever had to persevere through, I do know. And so as a writer, as somebody looking to capture these stories, it's hugely important to focus on what are the right questions to ask and what questions resonate the most with people. Um, and a couple ways you can do that. Somebody's just trial and error. Like a lot of the questions that I found out resonate with people is trial and error. Um, but you can also start with different themes, right? So you could say, well, if you're interviewing somebody that's obviously, I guess they would have to be alive if you're interviewing them, if you're interviewing somebody, you could start with different themes and say, what themes really resonate with you or, or, you know, is it faith? Is it your academic achievement? 
Is it your career achievement? Is it money? Is it being a parent or a grandparent? Finding the topics that really high level resonate with people and then diving in from there. Um, at Story Saver, what we do is we break life down into 16 different um, essentially time periods. So, you know, we have like your um, your extended family, like, you know, your origin story, where you came from, your grandparents, parents, childhood, grammar school, high school, college, career, love, uh, faith, grandparenthood, you know, so we break it down into different sections. And then we ask our clients to go through and we have a, uh, a, a list of like several hundred questions. And we have a list where it's, we, it's more truncated and it's only like a few questions for each topic area. We ask them to go through, highlight the areas that they want to talk about. And then that's really instructive for us to drive the conversation to areas that they want to focus on and areas that they'll have stories about. Um, you had asked, Brian, about whether we typically focus on individuals or families. Um, and the answer is we've done both. I would say probably the lion's share of what we do is individuals. Uh, just as I was on the subway to my office this morning, somebody hired us to tell the story of his grand, his 88-year-old grandmother who's always wanted to write her life story. And so, um, you know, so that, that's a typical request. We also uh, get requests to um, write about families. Um, you know, uh, we get requests to write what I call tribute books. Tribute books meaning the person that we're writing about is deceased. And we have to interview living friends and family to tell this, their story. And we also will sometimes leverage a staff archivist to pull publicly available information. So shit manifest census information, marriage certificate, death certificate, things like that to cobble together a narrative. Yeah. Last part, that, that sounds like a, a lot of the work I do in genealogy when I'm researching somebody's background is you're, yeah, you're getting a lot of time size. I spend on doing archive work looking for those uh, those facts behind the stories that only tell, you know, the, the part of it. Um, I, I love that approach because I, I know one of the, the things that people have difficulty with is even approaching um, a grandparent um, that might have a wonderful story, but they'll not ask it. <clears throat> Remember hearing it as a kid, but, you know, they want to get into more and, and find out the details. They, they just don't know right, the right questions to ask. And I think having a, a resource of somebody that knows how to do that, knows how to get the, the information out of a, a person is, uh, is, is, is a wonderful service. Um, you know, and getting, like you said, you have to ask those, sometimes those leading questions, uh, so then it can lead into more, uh, more detail. Um, but it's asking the right way to ask it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Robert Caro, who's one of my my heroes, um, you know, he wrote the biography of um, LBJ, um, Robert Moses, just somebody that I really look up to. And, and uh, one of the things that he said when you're questioning people is silence is your best friend. You know, let's say you ask somebody a question and they may hem and they haw or they're not exactly sure what to say and you just... You know, you don't want to make it uncomfortable. We're not trying to grill grandma or grandpa and and um, and make it so that they they're they're uncomfortable. But you know, a lot of so a lot of the pushback that we get is people say, "Well, I don't know, I don't remember anything, or I don't know what I'll remember." You know, I'm getting a little bit older, and my memory is not what it used to be. But once you start this process what tends to happen is people's memories really come alive and memories trigger other memories. And we'll say, you know, something very specific. What was your favorite, what was your favorite um, toy as a child? And they say, oh, I don't know. And it's actually, you know, and you just let it, let it marinate for a bit. And then they say, oh, actually it was this doll. 
And then when they have that memory, that triggers another memory. And all of a sudden they're telling a really heartfelt story about their interaction with their mother or their father when they were growing up. So, um, you know, again, asking the right questions, giving people time to reflect upon it, to come up with a cogent response, uh, you know, are, are, are important ways of going about it. And another another thing that happens, Brian, when um, when we do this, a lot of a lot of our clients are adult children purchasing this for their mother, or their father, their grandmother, their grandfather. And sometimes the older person or the person being interviewed will say, you know, this feels like an exercise in vanity. You know, who cares what I, you know, what my childhood was like, or who cares about my story? We always say, listen, this is not for you. This is not for you to beat your chest and tell the world how great you are. This is a gift that you're giving to your children and your grandchildren. So it's not for you. It's for them. And it is deeply meaningful to them. I can tell you 100% of the time people are interested to hear stories of their grandmother and their grandfather, their mother and their father and where they came from. What do you do um, when you don't have that person alive or um, they they lived in a period where there's very few people that remember them. Um, what's, what's the, what's your process there as a, as a writer to, to fill out that story? Um, you mentioned searching the archives and getting the facts. Um, but what do you do to build that story around or how do you, how do you approach that as far as biography writing? So, you know, a lot of times when you when you think of like a biography that's written about somebody, it's about a publicly a public figure. So just to go back to Robert Caro. Robert Caro, when he wrote about LBJ, there are entire libraries filled with paperwork, capturing just about every aspect of LBJ's life. Um, Robert Carroll went back to the hometown that LBJ came from and interviewed people that were alive when, when, when LBJ was alive and had stories about him. So when it's a publicly known figure, particularly a politician, particularly a president or a senator, somebody where information has to be kept, um, it's a lot easier to cobble together the information, right? It's it's out there, it's existing. I think um, I think Robert Caro said there was something like 32 million documents saved in the LBJ uh, library, right? So literally more than he could ever go through. When it's not a publicly available, when excuse me, when it's not a public figure, it's a lot more challenging. Right, so the majority of what we do are capturing stories for people who we can interview people who are still alive and that can re share those stories, right? So um, we're typically, well, not typically, we're not writing about people that um, passed away two to three generations ago and, and we don't have any publicly available information. Now, if somebody were to come to me and say, hey, I want to write a book about my father who was a, a U.S. senator in the, in the 1950s, like we, we could definitely pull a lot of publicly available information to assemble that. Most of our clients, that's not the case. And so we would rely upon word of mouth and then we would validate a lot of what we were told with that, you know, what we can pull from an archive. Um, yeah, but we, you know, that's, there's a quote, Brian, that I really like, and it, and it is, death steals everything except stories, and if you're not careful, it can steal those too, and so, you know, a lot of times, again, unless you're publicly, unless you're a public figure, if you're not somehow capturing these stories, these notes, these thoughts, they disappear into the ether. And interestingly, we have never been in a more connected world. You know, it's, you're up in Canada, right? I'm in New York City. 
Um, we've been emailing, texting, just like I do with other business colleagues and friends. We've never been more connected. We've also never been more disconnected as a people, in my opinion. And I think one of the challenges from a saving stories, saving narratives, is not only is everything digital, but we don't, you know, we could rely on letters, postcards, journals, things like that that exist, you know, throughout the throughout the decades. We don't really have that anymore. So again, and it, interestingly enough, everything is documented these days, you know, via email, text, whatever. But it's also in the ether. And if we don't, if we're not careful, you know, that imprint can just remain in the digital wasteland. Um, never would be seen or heard by any of our loved ones. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm thinking that, like, just when you mentioned that, I, I've often thought. That this generation, their great grandkids are probably going to have more pictures of them than ever before, but not actually know the stories behind those pictures and what their everyday life was, because you know they're they're not out uh, uh, drinking coffee. It wasn't probably more than their whole life. But how many pictures of them probably holding up their Starbucks or their uh, yeah. cafe latte? Would, uh, you know, will be out there. Um, Whereas I know I, I came across something last year my mom had was just these little tiny notebooks from her grandfather, my great grandfather, that just had, you know, maybe a sentence a day. They're, this, they're not even in any particular order. I think he just picked them up and wrote on them. Um, I think it's interesting things like being here in Canada, um, you know, things when the news would hit. When um, at the yard died, he just, it, it, he wrote, um, Mr. Roosevelt died, and it was it, it was so. Unless I actually connected the date, I wouldn't think it was just a neighbor because he wrote the same thing, like Mr. McDonald. Um, you know, oh, I brought in. It, it was in between, like I brought in load of coal today. Um, you know, going king next week, like it was just those things. But those, that tells a story that I never even realized because he recorded the date, and I'm assuming that's the day he wrote it because some of the the next one is a couple of days later. Um, is that even the news it was communicated quickly it, it, when the Japanese bomb in Pearl Harbor? He just he wrote. I mean, Canada had already been in the war at this point. He wrote, um, Jap "Japanese attack USA. The war starts for real now." Which, as a Canadian, mm. interesting to see that perspective. Um, yeah, and and yeah, it's just part of a a, a story that's stuck stuck in there amongst other things um and i i really got a sense of his personality which i never knew because he died when my mom was 10 years old so she barely knew him and didn't have even a lot of memories of him but it was uh it, it was great and i don't know i i have friends when i was in university one of my friends he while being a journalist he has journals he said going back from me was about 12 years old because we we, we used to say oh <laughs> Do you remember something he'd look back and he goes, Oh yeah, that and he goes, I remember that the because he had the weather and everything and it was I um yeah and once I started reading these things with my my grand great grandfather I said I was talking to him, I said, you know, you 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 were just an old man well before your time because that was the type of things he had. Just those everyday little yeah. little occurrences that but actually added some some meaning to it, like um because we had an argument once about how it seems like Good Friday is always a, a terrible weather. It's it, it seems overcast and dreary, and he he was able to go back and yeah and look at all his his records. Um, well, you know, it, it's a couple things you said that I think I think are interesting. Is um, you, you mentioned uh, like people have more photos, right, in, in future generations. And you might be right. I, I don't know. But I also think that, um, you know, we, we have so many photos that it also makes the thought of, like, ever printing them out and, like, having them in physical form seem overwhelming. And I know that, you know, you can go to Vista Print and, and you can, you know, just send in your 100 photos and it's printed out in a book and totally get it. Um, but my feeling is that, most people aren't going to do that. 
Like, I don't, I literally, I have thousands and thousands of photos. Let's take a look. How many photos do I have here? Does it tell me? I have 21,000 photos on my phone. Am I going to really go through, and, and a lot of those are important to me, but am I really going to go through, or, you know, maybe when I update, you know, my eighth iPhone from now, those pictures disappear. So again, I, I don't know, um, you know, if, if we will actually retain those photos. I know that like my father was a huge photographer and we used to get so frustrated as kids because everywhere we were going, we always, everybody stop, freeze, take a photo. And it's like, God, dad, like how many photos do we have to have of us getting spaghetti dinner? And, and, you know, this is back when you actually had like analog film, you know, and you'd have 30 photos and you have to go get them processed and whatnot. But we still have those photo books. They're still in my house. My father, unfortunately, passed away. We sell those photo books and I'll go home. I'll bring a friend home and we'll go down and we've got an entire shelf full of them. Um, and it brings me to another point. You know, a lot of times, Brian, people will say, you know, Joe, why, uh, why, do, you, why do you create books? Like, isn't that antiquated? You know, why don't you create a DVD or why don't you record YouTube videos of a you know, grandmother or grandfather speaking. And I always say, technology is invalidated very quickly. Um, you know, we're still reading Leonardo da Vinci's sketchbooks that were written 500 years ago. I don't think there's ever a more effective way to transfer thoughts, stories, pictures, drawings through time. But good luck playing the DVD you got for your birthday in 2013. You know, I don't have a DVD player. So we think books are the most effective medium to do that. And then the other thing that you said that I thought was interesting, you referenced your grandfather and and, and just some of the banalities of, of life, what the weather was like and whatever. And a lot of people will say, you know, um, let's say, Joseph, my life just isn't that interesting. You know, I know my family wants me to do this, but... It's not that interesting. They said, well, let me say this. Your life might not be interesting to the whole world, right? So my father, I mentioned he passed away in 2015 at the age of 67. His, the whole world is unfortunately, you know, it doesn't want to read my father's story, right? Uh, he's an incredible man, incredible father, but that's not the light. He wasn't Nelson Mandela. He wasn't Barack Obama. So the whole world might not find your story interesting. But you know who will find your story interesting? Your children, your grandchildren, your family. And um, so that's one thing. That, the other thing I tell people is I said, things that you perceive as banal and trite and meaningless now will be fascinating 50, 60 years from now. You know, what car did you drive? What did you do for work? You know, things... Uh, Careers that people had 80 years ago, they must have been the most, could have been the most trivial, boring thing. Now it's fascinating. With the passage of time, you know, we're capturing these stories. Um, so even if they are quote unquote boring, when time passes and people are able to read about it, it suddenly becomes fascinating. Exactly. Uh, I know your, your thing about um, the books being still relevant years from now I, I happen to agree um i mean even look at something like music how long ago did they say oh lps are done there are no more vinyl but people it's a big thing now it's a prestige thing to have your album done in vinyl it, people like the quality of the sound and um and and it's actually kind of made a, a comeback uh, uh, as far as physical um physical product uh, and books. I love books. Just be, I, you know, there's books I'll read on an e-reader, but there's books I want to have. So I want the part of my library. I want that physical being yeah. able to touch, touch and that, you know, the age that books take on, the, the smell of, as they age and stuff, it, it all has meaning and a story to me. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I, I, I tend to be, I'm oh, sorry about that. Oh, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's, there's going to be, you know, it's it's because you could do something probably yeah digitally, but it's it's not going to last. Um, you know, you pay for it on a website, that server goes down, um, gets hacked, it's it's gone. All that works is 
um, gone for you. You know, YouTube, if they decide that they're not, they're going to just actually become a streaming movie service, you know, and your yep. videos get taken down in 10 years, who knows? Um, yeah, so th there is yeah. that. Yeah, there, 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 there are even like nostalgia, uh, uh, you know, I'd say like, I kind of sometimes say I'm kind of in a little bit of like the nostalgia business. And, you know, there are even companies that you pay a monthly fee and they guarantee to like um, manage your digital profile after you die. You know why people are concerned about uh their digital profile after they die i'm not quite sure but you know it's funny because i mean you pay that company and i'm sure while well, that company is in existence they'll, they'll do that the moment they go out of business that's it right um and now no matter if i have story saver goes out of business tomorrow it doesn't matter for our clients that we've generated books for you know those books are theirs and um you know uh we expect them to last through the ages i often tell clients my indicator of success when you work with them is if the books that we create are on their grand grandchildren and great grandchildren's coffee stands 80 years from now when they and i are long gone that's the indicator of success for us and we think that through books we can do that exactly you're right because of Something happens that, that will always be there. You can't take that physical thing away unless you physically remove it. Um, it, it and it's one of I, one of the things you were saying is something I always when you're talking about the banality of the stories. One thing I think people have a no idea of history now, and I think when you bring that personal story, um, for instance, a, a grandparent or great grandparent that went through a depression, if you the, 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 the depression, um, you know, they had stuff, uh, uh, an understanding that you can personally connect it. It makes history that much more um, meaningful to you. And it actually, it, it helps you understand the world and how you got to where, where you are now. Um, you know, there's there's things in my my background, I just remember this is always what we, we did as a, a kid and I, I never under, understood them so i started digging deeper and oh that's a habit from my grandparent oh that's a that's a um, uh, for my scottish side of the family that's something that's was a common practice in scotland and yeah. brought it over you know it's uh, um my my uh, my great grandmother um i was i blessed enough somebody had recorded her the, the year before she died for um, a university research um, on people that grew up in a mining town and I have this hour and some uh, video interview and she tells these wonderful stories about her parents, her, her kids from her perspective that I I never knew even from my grandfather, her son, I'd gotten part of it, but I didn't know how did his mother actually feel when he went off to World War II. Um, you know, how, how, did she, how did she deal with things? Uh, it's it just you know really put me in more in touch and wanting to know more also they he always used to make baked beans my grandfather was famous for baked beans and his mother in this interview talks about how she had this pot that she had since she was married so for 60 some odd years at this point that she made beans in every saturday night because that would be the meal and uh, she said she said um you know if you if there was um, an expression of how did the, my grandfather used to say it too you you could know if you had beans on saturday night um when you go you could tell who had beans on saturday night when you go to church on sunday morning so, <laughs> yep yep um <laughs> well, you know it, it's uh, an interesting thing happens brian is um i always tell people it's like we know our family but we don't really know them in the way that we think we do in the sense that, you know, um, let's just use my mother. My mother's 74. I'm very close to her, speak to her every day, see her every other week. Um, and, you know, we talk about what's going on, what's she doing today, what am I doing, what's, what challenges am I running into, and what did I have for lunch? 
Um, and so I was, if somebody were to say to me, you know, are you close to your mom? I'd say, yeah, I can't imagine anyone being closer to their mother than I am. But we don't take the time to, like, and I've never taken the time to, you know, sit down and ask my mom questions about her life. Like, um, what did she want to be when she was a little girl? Who was her best friend? Um, you know, why did she end up going to the college that she went to? You know, so even though I'm speaking to her on a daily basis, I'm not answering these questions. And when, whether it's through working with a professional or just sitting down and having a cup of coffee and asking these questions, it's really fascinating to know like, oh yeah, of course I know my mom, like as good as a son can know my mom, but like, there's so much I don't know. And it's quite interesting because oftentimes those experiences are the reason that they are the person that you know them for today. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, like the, the personal stories you were talking about, like, the, you know, the, the eating beans and, and whatnot, it, it's, it's interesting, right? And like, you know, uh, like when my mother was uh, growing up, like they literally had like milk deliveries, right? They, like a milkman that would come by with the, the glass container and, and uh, in my, the house actually, my, my sister purchased a house a few years ago and there's this little tiny uh, door window thing on the side of the house. And nobody could figure out what it was. And we realized that's where the milkman used to put the milk. Um, and, and so even like a little, things like, what's that? You know, all now, cause I remember the milkman and we had a bread man too that used to come. And deliver bread. Yeah. But it, it's, it's fascinating, you know, like, wow, that's so cool. And now I can just like do Uber eats. Right. And, 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 uh, you know, my, I, I can relate to some degree to like that notion. Right. Cause I, I grew up in a time before the internet and, you know, I have to go to the, the grocery or the baker. But like for my nieces and nephews right now, like that's crazy. Like what a milkman, like what is that? Um, and, you know, another interesting thing, Brian, about going through this process is like, in some ways, like we all know like the major or we, some of us know better than others, but the, the, the major like turning points in like world history. So, you know, Pearl Harbor, and World War II and JFK's assassination and the Vietnam War and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 9-11. But there's this um, a writer who I really, really appreciate. And he actually won the Pulitzer Prize for a book called The Good War. His name was Studs Terkel. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but The Good War was really fascinating because it was about World War II. But why he won the Pulitzer Prize he didn't focus on the Battle of Iwo Jima or the, you know, the firebombing of Tokyo or anything like that. He focused on the personal impact that the war had on people. You know, so a woman's husband went off to fight. And what were the challenges for her at home? How did the war impact her individually as a person? And people connected with that because it's, it's easy for me to understand that than it is to understand well fortunately it's easier for me to understand that than what it would be like to be at the battle of Iwo Jima you know I've never been to any in any military um, type conflict so um, it's fascinating to hear the personal side and how major world events affected people personally particularly people in your family that you love look up to and admire I think you're right and it, I mean I I did the middle, medieval history in university because I didn't understand economics, the law, supply, and demand. I didn't understand there's really no demand for medieval historians unless you, you want to be a professor at university, which I did not want to. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I remember one of my actually uh, Renaissance and Reformation courses, we were, we were reading a, a diary of a, a servant of the Medici family of in, a, in Venice, and um, that because we always hear of history, you know about the 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 generals, the kings, the presidents, and stuff. But you don't mm. really yeah. know what the other person was like, and this really it spoke to me. And um, because 
that's that's stories are more interesting. Um, I'm thinking like bands, band of brothers that they could have told that story just from the perspectives of the the generals that were organizing all the different battles. It wouldn't be interesting. It was the stories that were attached there, the um, the personal the personal anecdotes that made that um, an, an exciting read and an exciting uh, thing to watch. You know, it, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think people would know it. It would just been an, another you know war war novel uh, or war um recount if if it wasn't for that um so yeah those, those personal stories are what speak to us and like i said that's puts us in that place of history of understanding it and really enjoying it yeah that's the uh, the you know i mean it's it's a really good point like the servant of, of my DVD. it's uh yeah, it's 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 uh more relatable um, and it's just, yeah, it's fascinating to understand what it was like for a regular person and not not just a Roman emperor at that time. <clears throat> and yeah, even more fascinating when it's somebody that you're related to. You know, I think as, as human beings, we have an innate and unending desire to know where we came from. Um, you know, I think that's been since time immemorial. We've always wanted to know where we came from. and. Uh, that obviously that that um, affects what I do with storytelling. It obviously also affects genealogy, and you know I think um, going on a little bit of a tangent, but I think genealogy really, you know, people have always been fascinated to know where they came from, but it wasn't really until the advent of the internet that I think it became possible for people to really explore that without traipsing to different churches and organizations to physically look through documents. So one of the many uh the internet has given us some blessings and some curses but from a genealogical perspective i think it's been a blessing <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely, uh, I, i've been able to look at documents that i never would have unless i actually ventured over to scotland and um plowed over books 20 years ago plowed over things physically because there was no indexing no easy to find where i can go to a, a, a scotland's people and can to see records of the marriage records of my well, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth great grandparents, and I can see what their signature looked like in some cases. I, I can see what their occupation was listed as. Um, you know, I uh, it's it's really it's really interesting. I know yeah. one of my early things in genealogy. Um, I was researching a relative and. It was a, it was a cousin. It would well, it would be a, a cousin of, um, not a direct relation on my great grandfather, and he was a, an unsolved murder mystery in the city of Halifax, and he in Nova Scotia, uh, he was captain of a ship, and he he was murdered. No, to this day, him and his wife to this day, nobody had ever solved it. So I was doing some research to try to find out what kind of information he had in. And I, I got really taken up um, looking at the, the police logs, but I, I got taken up on the stories of the people that weren't related to me by just looking, well, why do I see this person's name in there regularly? Uh, yeah. they, they were the town drunk. That's why. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you get those. Memorialized forever. Yeah. You get those, those, those things that you can see those. And then when he, he's, this person suddenly disappeared, like, okay, did he sew up or is he, you know, what happened to him? It, it left me uh, with that mystery. I wanted to know, but I just didn't, because it wasn't a real but I didn't really take it further. Um, I really, yeah, I think that, you know, there's so much in history people don't realize. Um, I know, like I said, my grandmother's story from listening to her, I didn't realize that as she tells a story about my grandfather and one of his brothers, they had um, the whooping cough. So, that they lived in a small mining uh, community, and what they did was they the, she sent them to work with her father, her husband, their father, and they laid and slept on the the floor of the coal mine um, to to get rid of the whooping cough. Something I never would have thought of. I can't imagine if I would was to tell um, you know the authorities, say, "Yeah, I'm take my son down to the coal mine with me. Uh, he's he's got the whooping cough. This will fix him up. People will be yeah, yeah." Uh, I don't know if that's I probably get busted, but it was 
would have been normal because I'm sure she just didn't think of it herself. Somebody would have done it before. Um, yeah, it's, and I've, I've listened to home remedies from relatives or I found information on that they, they would try it through looking at stuff. And it's, you, you got to cut thumbs with horse manure, dip your thumb in horse manure. I, I, that would be the complete opposite of what I would think, but apparently it worked and this was a common thing. It's, um, so I, I really find those stories, you know, interesting. And I, and when you, I think people, yes, yeah, so, so often they don't, they think their life is banal because, and uninteresting, but to somebody, you know, 50, hundred years later, that that's going to be a, a, exciting. Um, that's going to be, you know, it, it it's going to be so unique because if we think of how much things even changed in our life, like I said earlier, I had a milkman and a bread man that came to when I was young, and I remember that when they stopped coming to us, and, and there was always the joke, you know, oh, you're the you're the milkman's son. If you told that to a kid today, they wouldn't understand. Yeah, they they wouldn't they wouldn't get it. Um, you know that that type of a thing it just it's just lost uh, you know a rotary phone i, I actually remember in a, our um in our my family's had a, what they call a bungalow where they were from it's a, a cottage that was, uh, on a uh, near a beach area um and i remember the party line you know picking it up and getting all the neighbors gossip because you could listen in if you wanted to um you know, things like that, kids, 20, 30 years, for that are, well, my, my, my kids, when I, we've talked to them about that, so my wife had similar experience, you know, they, they don't understand, I'm like, what, what do you need a party line, like, do you, do you go on and you're having a party, no, it's, it's shared, um, because they, you know, they're so used to having a phone everywhere with them, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing, and, and that, and just talking about some of those things to my own kids, you know, they're just, boy, you're antiquated. Like, what, what, did, you, what did you do? You, you actually, um, you know, you you want to find somebody's phone number? You have to look in a book. The way that everybody's story is interesting to to somebody else, um, and uh, and I think people have a hard time understanding that themselves. You're right when you, you talk to them but you bring up those stories and you can and you and you talk to them and you you, you get that that excitement um so what would your your recommendation be for somebody who is wanting to build up that um that that biography of them themselves their parents their their grandparents um what 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 do they need to do to really get started before they even talk to somebody like you who, who's going to put all that information in, together? Um, you know where where where's it where's a good place to to start? Um, like I said as a genealogist and the majority of the people that are, are listening to my podcast are genealogists have been interested in it some well and they they understand sort of the, the getting the facts, but how do you how do you gather them? What, you know, if you're using uh, your service or service like yours, what, what kind of information should they be bringing to them to, to, or what type of information, you know, even if they're doing it themselves, that are important to tell that good story. So, um, you know, when you are doing something like this, I think you. Uh, this might sound like a platitude or trite, but start with what you know. It can be very daunting to do something like this. You think like, well, gosh, like how am I gonna capture grandma or grandpa's story? And like, what don't I know about them? And you know, it, it can be sort of overwhelming. And so if you're looking to do this, capture the story for loved ones, kind of start with what you know. Um, you can look at publicly available information that might be helpful. You know, if I'm saying, well, you know, like, for example, my grandfather, um, you know, uh, I know he was a firefighter. I know he's he's passed now, but assuming he was alive, you can 
also research, see what information is, information is publicly available and is out there to help you understand more about your grandmother or your grandfather or your mom or your dad's life. Um, see who will speak to you. You know, um, some people are trepidatious about doing something like this. Um, I remind people that, um, you know, my, my writers, I remind them, <clears throat> being interviewed is a very uncomfortable process. Um, and the people that we typically are interviewing have never been interviewed before. And Brian, I don't know if you, have you ever been um, publicly quoted? Like has, has somebody come up to you and said, hey, Brian, what are your perspective on this? Or how do you feel about this or that? Has that ever happened to you where you were quoted in a newspaper, or magazine, or an article? It has, yes. Did you feel 100% satisfied with how you were depicted in the article? No. <laughs> yes, exactly. Nobody ever is. It's like, oh gosh, I thought I was more eloquent and I thought I was smarter and I thought I illustrated my point better. So it's it's a daunting thing. And so, you know, when you do this, I think it's, important to be, um, you know, see who will actually be willing to speak with you and also be very gentle with, with them. Um, a questionnaire is really good to help pique people's interest. Um, again, we have questionnaires, several hundred questions broken down into linear life stages that I explained before, and then also thematically. Um, we put a lot of time and effort into thinking of all the questions, because again, as I said before, not every question is going to generate a response. Some questions will generate blank will generate a blank response, and some question will create a fountain of information. So over time, we've curated and tweaked and revised our questionnaire so that um, it will pique people's curiosities and their memories. By the way. I'm happy to give that out to any of your listeners. If they're curious, they can just email me at joseph at storysaverstorysavor.com. Again, joseph at storysaver.com. I'm happy to give them our proprietary questionnaire to give me a long one and a short one. But sometimes when, you, when you're thinking about interviewing somebody, they think that this is somewhat daunting. You can give them this questionnaire and say, hey, listen, just go through it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to write the story. You don't have to record. You just earmark where, you know, uh, things that peak ideas or, or memories in your head. Um, in terms of uh, capturing the stories, uh, what I would recommend, uh, you know, you can just sit there and, and just copy as somebody speaking. So they're just being, you're trying to, you know, capture shorthand what they're saying. Um, but I think recording is good. Recording is good for two reasons. Number one, you will have another medium through which you capture their story, right? So you can hear, oh, that's what my great-grandmother or my great-grandfather sounded like, you know, for future generations. And the second thing is with the advent of AI, you know, as, as a journalist, back in the day, if I had a, an hour-long transcript that I needed, uh, an hour-long interview I needed to transcribe, it might cost me $150, $200 to have a professional to do that. With technology today, you can, and then by the way, take, you know, $150, 200 bucks in a week. Now you can use ChatGPT to have it transcribed for a dollar or two in about five minutes. And it will do a better job of transcription than any human being because it gets even the most obscure references. So I would suggest recording it. And then if you want to take those recordings and put them into a book, pay to, um, excuse me, use this software to, to transcribe it for free. And by the way, again, joseph at storysaver.com. If you want, um, now this is not, I'm not charging people. I'm just saying I can introduce them to the technology so that they can do it themselves. Um, and then the last thing I would say, Brian, is, a question that I get from a lot of people is I say, Joseph, why should I hire you to tell my story or the story of my grandparent? And I always tell them, 
emphatically, if you have the skill and the discipline to do this, then you should do it yourself. Nobody will ever care about your story more than you care about it. But if you don't have the time, the discipline, the skill, that's when you bring in a professional and that's when you bring in my company and, and people that can assist. But for the vast majority of people, I hope that they do do it themselves. It's a wonderful project. And, you know, if they don't feel like doing it, then you uh, hire a professional to deal with all the headaches that sometimes <laughs> can come along with the process. I mean, I'm thinking even if I had the skill to write it, I would really not have to put it all together and edit it to, to go out and get it produced, um, yeah. which kind of leads into... Well, Matt, I, I want to say my, my last question, but maybe maybe not depending where it goes, is um, how often when you are coming and doing a, a biography uh, for somebody, uh, I sense these are usually for, you're probably doing with family, maybe um, if the person was particularly interesting in a community, maybe a community or whatever. But how many, how many times do you come across, you know, with, this story really needs to hit that wider audience. Um, that this this person uh, this person's story has an impact greater than they think and greater than their family or their community maybe um, does that happen frequently or is it a well I would say nine out of ten clients are reaching out to us because they want to capture their it's either a senior citizen's looking to capture their story. Well, not, not even senior citizens. I mean, we just, we're doing a book right now for a 37-year-old woman. Anybody that wants to capture their story, for whatever reason, um, a lot of times it's just to document their life. Um, a, a lot of times it's to document overcoming trauma. When I tell you a very significant portion of our clients are writing a book to talk about overcoming trauma, whether that's overcoming domestic abuse, whether that's overcoming cancer, eating cancer. Uh, so nine out of time, 10, nine times out of 10, it's people that just want to capture for their family and their loved ones. Not only that, but they explicitly do not want their story shared beyond that. You know, these are personal stories and you know, it's for the family. Um, every once in a while, somebody will come across who will say, I want my story to be commercially published. And, uh, you know, by the way, Brian, that's one of the first questions I'll ask somebody when they come to me and I'll say, I, two, two, two major questions. What is your story? And they'll say, oh, I want to talk about the time I went to the 1982 Olympics or whatever. And the second question is why you want to tell your story. You know, very important to know what their reason is. You know, they say, oh, well, I want to be, a, you know, a, a New York Times bestselling memoirist. Okay, it's possible, but that's difficult to do. But it's important for us to understand because it's two different tracks. So when we come across a client, whether they start out with the intention to have it commercially published or they realize that it's something that should be commercially published. Um, we have, right now what we do is we do the research, the ghostwriting, the editing, formatting, and publishing. So we literally soup to nuts. All you have to do is get on the phone with us and allow us to interview you over the phone or over Zoom. We do all of that. And we actually print and publish and send you these books. People that want it to be more, we also have partnerships with some of the biggest marketing and publishing companies in the country that can assist with getting into the hands of thousands of people, um, getting it on Amazon bestseller list, Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, New York Times. So. Um, that is not our typical client. Again, most of the time, people are just hiring us to capture their story for their family. But for the people that do have bigger ambitions, you know, we do have connections to make that a reality for them. 
for my question was not whether the person wanted to be commercial or you would obviously not pursue commercial if they didn't want, but you, you think you, this story is just, this is so interesting. Um, you know, I, I guess it gets back to our point, but the banality of, um, you know, what we think of our own story sometimes is, you know, this story is interesting. It's, it's, it won't be just interesting to your family, but you have, you know, it's, it's something that um, other people would enjoy beyond that because I'm sure that that must be a, a, a thought that comes up when. So, so I, I understand. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're finalizing book for a woman right now. I, I won't um, yeah. include her name or any, any specifics, but uh, she uh, was uh, born and lived in Vietnam right after the Viet Vietnam War. And, uh, you know, obviously a war-torn country and fled to China, we lived in a refugee camp fled to the United States with nothing, barely speaking English, and now operates a multi-million dollar business in America. And we wrote her story um, of coming to the US. And uh, I called her and I said, you know, I'll use a fake name, Tina. I said, your clients that come to your business I think they would really be interested to know your story, to know what you overcame. And so what we're going to do for her is, and I'm probably going to go down and when this happens, we're going to do a book launch at her place of business and share her story with her clients because we think it's something that uh, people will be interested in and uh, it will make her clients more interested in doing business with her. So that definitely does happen when i feel like that situation arises i will tell the client and you know sometimes they'll say eh, i'm not interested you know stories my story is great it's fantastic um it probably could be commercially successful probably could help a wider audience but i'm not interested and of course i respect those wishes but um you know i will, will i will sometimes have those conversations with clients it'd be, it'd be exciting i know and just to to think that you know, knowing that there's somebody else that can find value in it, it, it um, I'm sure a person, even like even if it is just their own family, as we talked about earlier, there's a the uh, that would you know kind of freak you up, especially when you you can explain you know there's there's people that are going to find this interesting, your your or your family's going to find this interesting. Um, you know, or people in the community that you're involved in, the, the men was going to find this interesting because this is a, just a it's a it's a great story. And um, okay, so that's I just want to sort of wrap up here. So um, so before we go, Joseph, um, is anything else you want to give? If there's one piece of advice, if one central thing um, for a person that's wanting to capture their story or somebody else's what what would uh, what would you say to to do or even better yet if a person's living today and they're they're forward thinking and thinking wow somebody might want i do have an interesting story maybe somebody in the future might want to know it what should i do as a, an individual to to make that easier for sure my piece of advice one of the challenges that we have, Brian, is that there's oftentimes not a sense of urgency to record stories. So somebody will say, well, I'm 85 years old. I've always wanted to do this, but why, why do I need to get started this week or next week or next month or six months or I'll do it next year or when after the holiday season and and sometimes it sounds like I'm like using salesman talk, which I, I really try to stay away from. I mean, I'm not trying to fear monger people when I say, or fear monger when I say this, but it's something I really believe. And that is, it's never too early to start writing your story, but it can definitely be too late. And, you know, I learned again, very painfully, you know, my father passed, you know, he passed at 67 and uh, I never got to do this with him. 
I remember, you know, sitting in the hospital room a day or, or three or four days before he passed away, and he, we were just talking about his life and what, you know, he was telling me stories from his youth, and I said, man, I wish, I wish I had focused on asking him these questions a long time ago. I wish I had the presence of mind to ask him these questions and record them, because um, it's like that line I used before, death steals all things except stories and it can steal them if you're not careful right so you know again a lot of this sounds like fear mongering or you know p- you know people need to do it now but there really is a lot of truth in it so my my piece of advice would be if this is something that your listeners want to do for themselves if this is something they want to do for a loved one um create that urgency we don't know tomorrow's never promised and um you know we want to safeguard these stories for for future generations I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. It's been quite enjoyable. Um, picked up a, a few really interesting tidbits. I, I really like the those two um, the two sayings about the the urgency. Because it is something that when I do talk to relatives and I know other people do, it's uh, well, you know, we don't need to talk about that. Now. We'll get you. We'll get together sometime and um, and do it. It's just. It's, people forget that um you know life is life is fleeting and um we don't know what tomorrow brings for sure so thank you very much and you have a great day you too thanks for having me on brian appreciate it so as promised i wanted to take this time to let you know about my plans for 2024 this is my commitment to you It's to bring you more great content right here through this podcast, but also on YouTube and elsewhere. In 2023, I'm afraid I let you down as I didn't have a clear plan and ability to execute it. This here is my commitment for 2024 to bring being more regular. Besides getting back to this podcast, my plan is to make one unique video each week, digging deeper into my own family history, but also sharing with you the tools and methods I'm using In addition, I want to make at least one short video a week answering your questions about genealogy research. I will also try to do more regular live streams so you can ask your questions in person. I'm going to try and share these out across more platforms than just YouTube. And as I said at the beginning of the podcast, I want to share more of your family stories by giving you an opportunity to share your story. In the description of this podcast, you will see where you can uh, you, you will see a link where you can ask a question. Tell me why you would like to be a guest and share your story, or just to give me some feedback. I really appreciate hearing from you, so please take the time and fill out the form, or just leave your question or comment be- below in the comment section. I only want to get better, so I appreciate your input. So, until next time, have a great month. And keep searching for your ancestors.